of asana work. And very quickly, this would become your definition of asana. Once you're able to sit, the next exploration is, I'm sitting still, yet my mind is running all over the place. Now, what the yogis found is that if you want to really focus, you got to work with the breath. So we said, let's work with the reliable instrument. The first was the body, the breath as part of the body. Now, nobody on the planet can thread a needle while breathing. Yeah, you can try it. At points of focus, the body stops to breathe. You cannot shoot a gun while breathing. The body will arrest breathing, so focus happens. So once yogis started to see things like that, they worked backwards. When I need focus, my body stops to breathe. Therefore, if I stop to breathe, I will get focus. Yeah, somatopsychic work. Whenever you need focus, you just stop breathing. The question arises, how long can you stop breathing? Right? Now, try this. Just take in a deep breath. Hold your breath. You can even close your eyes if you need. But as you hold your breath, you will find that your ability to listen to what I'm saying is much higher. Because there's no inner conversation going on in your mind. Are we there? You can release. Therefore, if I really want to get into meditation, I need to have a sustained period of focus. That is going to happen if I'm able to hold my breath. So pranayam as a technique is either the holding of breath or the training to hold breath. Tasmin sati shwasa prashwasa, inhalation, exhalation, gathiro vikshedaha pranayama. Pranayam, we first need to understand what is prana. Prana, the closest English word is livingness. There's a certain livingness in me, there's a certain livingness in the food, there's a certain livingness in the air that allows me to come alive. Right? When I die, that livingness would have left the body, the body will decompose in a few hours. But the essence is that there's a quality of livingness. Now, how do I keep enhancing this livingness is the art of yoga. Prana, ayama, expansion. I am trying to expand my life force. That's what pranayama means. Some authors will define it using the word yama and not ayama. Yama means control. Prana, control. And then they will break it down and say breath control. That is too, too simplistic an understanding of the subject. Yeah? Today, there's a rage of mindful breathing. Yes, you breathe a little slower, your mind will slow down. But that's not really the art. If I breathe a little slower, if I exhale a little slower, my mind will be calm. But to use breathing just to calm the mind is not enough. Once you have a calm mind, is that the end of pranayam? No. Once you have a calm mind, that's just the start. The way I was trained by my guru was that, he said the first thing he told me, just stuck in my life, is that yoga is meant for people who are tired of happiness. Right? Right? Just take some time over the course of the day to ponder over it. Life is more or less sorted. Yeah. It can keep getting better for sure. But you are happy as a person. Now you can do yoga. Now yoga begins. Yeah. A lot of the time we use it to reach happiness. We use it as therapy. But that's fine. Yeah. As I always say, you are going from minus one to zero and yoga is effective for that. But the real fun begins when you are using yoga to go from zero to plus one. You are kind of sorted already. Now you start to explore. So mindful breathing will make you calm. But calm is not what you are after. You are looking for some transcendence. You want to go beyond. To go beyond, 
pranayama is then seen as expansion of life energy. I have a certain life energy, can I expand that? So the question arises, why? Now you know the answer already. You feel like shit when your energy levels are low. Yeah. When your energy levels are low, small things irritate you. You're jealous, you're angry, you're irritable. When you're high on energy, nothing really affects you much. When you're high on energy, you're naturally loving, you're naturally compassionate. Yeah? You don't need to be taught all these things. You just are relaxed and high on energy. You're naturally loving, you'll take care of people, you'll take care of things, you'll take care of yourself. When you're low on energy, yeah. so therefore, if I want to transform who I am, I have to transform my energy level. Yeah. Today, by and large, we are beginning to accept that everything in the cosmos is in a state of vibration. Atoms, galaxies, everything is moving. If it is moving, it must have a frequency. Therefore, I have a certain frequency, you have a certain frequency. Can I change the frequency? If I cannot change the frequency, there's no need to do yoga. If I'm born with a frequency, I'm going to die with the frequency. Why are we doing all this? If I can change the frequency, does it alter my day-to-day -day life? If it doesn't alter my day-to-day -day life, it really doesn't matter if I'm sitting in meditation and I can see this color or that color. It really doesn't matter. But if the frequency of my life changes, and it alters the way I interact as a person, it alters my vision of life, then it becomes interesting. Are we there? Yeah? Just because today you, you're living at a different frequency than yesterday, but the quality of your life, the quality of your interactions has not changed, it makes no difference. Yeah? So with pranayam, we spoke about calmness, that's definitely going to happen, that's not an issue. So can I raise the level of prana in me on a daily basis? Yeah. Now, when that happens more and more, I'm not going to delve in this time that we have. We don't have time to delve into what is aura and so on and so forth. But just, as a, just to skim the subject, bioplasmic energy field. Yeah. I would like you to go and sort of do a little bit of research on Kirlin. K-I-R-L-I-A-N was a Russian lab technician who developed a photographic plate in the 1970s. If I were to take your photo, I could see your aura. It's just a technique that he developed. So now that is called as bioplasmic energy field. Yeah. When you do pranayam, this aura becomes larger, proving the definition of prana ayama, expansion, life force. So much so, it is said that the Buddha and Christ, people like this, had auras of 2-2 two, two kilometers. Yeah. Now, it's just what we say. But essentially, what we find is that when a person gets a disease, say your liver or kidney has a problem, about six months before that, it shows in the aura body. There is an aura, there's a break in the aura here, in the prana field, and it shows about six months later in the physical body. So that is why some yogis or some saints, they look at you and they'll say, you have some problem in your kidneys. And you're saying, no, I'm fine. But they're able to see this. Right? Today machines can help us with that, but some people can see it. Now the question arises, are they talking rubbish or can they really see it? So what I would like to say to you is that, the visual spectrum that's open for us is about 0.001% of the visual spectrum that is there. My eyes are sensitive enough to see 0.001%. If I can improve my sensitivity to be able to see a little bit more, that's not called a miracle. That's called improving the capability, the sensitivity of my eyes. Today I can't understand it, so I call the man a saint, I call the man a miracle worker. But if I can improve the sensitivity of my own system, 
What a dog can sense, I cannot sense. The dog's got better smell than me. Yeah, it's just that the smell is there, I don't have the sensitivity. So we're coming back to the same point again and again. With yoga, you're enhancing the sensitivity of the system. I can sit here for it. When I say I, I mean anybody practicing, all of us. A person can sit here and have enough sensitivity to smell what they're cooking. If a dog can do it, it can be done. It's just that we have not trained it. Similarly with the eyes, similarly. So by and large, you'll find that what we are calling miraculous a hundred years ago, today has been proven. So what we are calling miraculous today will be proven, not proven, will be seen to be more commonplace. So you have to attune your body-mind to the highest level of sensitivity possible. That's yoga. Can I attune it so much that I know what's going on in the cosmos? I don't have to rely on a lot of machines. Simple thing, back in the day, a lot of people could do telepathy. Today, with a small amount of money, I can buy a mobile phone and I can talk to my mum. So I've got the technology today, but I don't have the, the capability to do the telepathy anymore. Right? So the sensitivity of the human being has to keep enhancing. And in that context, we're going to study pranayama. Can I expand the livingness within me? Now, what are the practical implications? If I'm going to use it through breath, there are three kinds of pranayama techniques. One is energizing, one is balancing, and one is tranquilizing. So before we study technique, let us also start to study how does the body breathe. Yeah, so please put your hand here and tell me which nostril is dominant right now for you. For me, it's the right nostril. So how many of you are right? So for how many of you are left? There will be some people for whom it's shifting right now, so it will be balanced. Yeah? This is called alternate rhinitis. Now look at this, right? I've been breathing for the last 39 years, and I didn't know that my body breathes through one nostril and then breathes through the other. And this is something that I should have been told when I was three or four years old. Right? This balance of these two nostrils is Hatha Yoga. Hakaram, Takaram. When I balance, so why should I balance? Yeah. When my right nostril is open, the Pingala Nadi is open. Prana Shakti or physical energy is higher. When my left nostril is open, and this shifts in a human being, every 60 to 90 minutes. Yeah? It shifts every 60 to 90 minutes. When my left nostril is open, Ida Nadi is open, Mana Shakti or intellectual energy is high. If you look at the symbol of medicine, the staff of Caduceus, you've got the staff, you've got the two snakes. Now you've been going to a doctor forever. The doctor should have told you why he's got that symbol. Or you should have questioned the doctor. Okay? Those two snakes, represent Pingala and Ida. Because health is dependent on a balance of physical and mental energy. Right? For your year today, we have this conversation. But it's the same thing. The two snakes, Ida, Pingala. Forget meditation. Just for health, you need a balance of physical and mental. Today, so many people are going through depression because there's too much mental energy and two less physical energy. So just to be healthy, you need that, that balance. When they studied the mental asylums, they found most people in the mental asylums are left nostril, mental energy, super dominant. 20 hours or so through the left nostril. If you're thinking, 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 you'll eventually be just sitting and thinking about something that happened to you 20 years ago. It happens to us daily, we are spending a lot of time just lost in thought. But we are functional. 
But a person in a mental asylum is no more functional. They spend hours together. About 3% of mental asylum people are violent. The rest are just sitting and thinking. Too much mental energy. When they saw people in jails, prisons, they found their right nostril super dominant. Too much physical energy eventually becomes violent. So you have to have the perfect balance. Yeah. If you think meditation is just a cerebral thinking process, you're very wrong. If I try to sit in meditation with my left nostril open, I'll be sitting, but my mind is running. I cannot be still. If I try to sit in meditation with my right nostril open like now, my body will keep feeling like moving. I'll feel like scratching. When I balance the two, as we'll do today in Anulom, as we did yesterday in Anulom Bilom, a lot of you said you liked the meditation. The meditation was nothing, nothing spectacular. It was a preparation that got you into silence. When you did Anulom Bilom, you balanced the right and the left. So when you balance the right and the left, then the third shushumna starts to rise. Every 90 minutes, when it's shifting, for 2-3 minutes, you're balanced. Either my right is working, or my left is working. When they balance, they negate each other. And that's when shushumna starts to rise. You'll do more lectures on this in greater detail. But when that starts to rise, you're naturally meditative, no effort required. Yeah? Sometimes you're just sitting and there is nothing you have to do and you're calm, you're at peace, you're in silence. You're doing nothing about it, it's just happening. Yeah? The question is, can I make that my natural state? Can this become more and more common for me? How am I going to train my body and breath? so that meditation becomes a spontaneous affair. In Tantra, in Yoga, we say, the evolution of the mind should be a spontaneous affair. Yeah? It shouldn't be a fight. If I'm fighting with my mind, no, I have to be, I have to meditate, or I have to transform, that's a problem. You're not going to go very far. But can it become a spontaneous affair? So if I train my body, sitting calm will not be an issue. If I train my breath, slowly I'll find I have access to my mind. So that pranayam is called anulom vilom pranayam. Anulom means with the grain, vilom means against the grain. Natural, unnatural. Now anulom vilom Actually, classical yoga is when I reach a state when I don't need to use my hands. Automatically, I can breathe through the left, lock, breathe out through the right, breathe in, lock, lock and call Anulom Bilom. Because it is so far-fetched for all of us, even this we call as Anulom Bilom because it is training to get there. This is also called as Nadi Shodhana. Nadi Shodhana, the same practice is also called as Nadi Shodhana. Nadi is the circuits of prana. So prana moves through the body through circuits. The Chinese call meridians and chi. In the Indian tradition, prana and nadis. Nadi comes from the word nadi. Nadi means a river. So a flow of energy. So when you do any asana, it's not really for the muscle. Yes, the muscle is working, but if I'm doing this, it is so that the prana flows in a particular manner in my body. Now, I can either do it through acupressure, acupuncture. The Chinese studied it predominantly from a healing perspective. Yoga studied it predominantly from a transcendence perspective. The yogis were very healthy. They're not really looking at health. They're looking at something beyond health. Now, how do I transcend it? So if I do any asana, it is so that prana flows in a way. After a yoga class, you feel very nice, loving, welcoming. After three, four hours, you may again be jealous, petty, angry. That may be your nature. But at least after the yoga class, 
for a few hours you are in a happy state yeah simply because of the way you have manipulated your body therefore prana has flowed in a particular manner if you do pranayam it will become even more so if you do meditation it becomes even more so you are just working more and more subtle practices yeah whether you like it or no after you finish a yoga class you won't feel like going and hitting somebody it is not possible because the prana has changed the thinking yeah. again i'm just going to skim on this sort of thing a human being is composed on five sheets annamaya kosha you'll study it at detail but you need to understand it to understand pranayam kosha means a sheet anna means food what you can see is a collection of all the food i've eaten for 40 years the yogis are weird such a beautiful body they call it annamaya kosha a collection of food <laughs> right they have weird names for everything <laughs> just such a beautiful body annamaya kosha the physical body composed of the food i've eaten pranamaya kosha second the energetic body yeah i like your vibe what am i saying i like your vibration i don't even know the logical understanding of what i'm saying no. but i like the vibes of the place prana maya the energy body the is matched little more subtle to that is the thought body mano maya kosha so physical is it too much for a day is it okay physical energetic thought so the thought is more subtle it can be measured as a cycle per second it's an energy now if i manipulate my body manage my body manage it will affect my thinking yeah try being calm when you have a terrible back ache the physicality will change the mentality yeah but when you're relaxed when you're worked with the prana you don't have to then work with the mind it will naturally be in a relaxed state little more subtle to that is vigyana v Vi, gnan means knowledge vigyan special knowledge special knowledge means intuition so the intuitive the psychic body sometimes you know something's right for you often times we don't listen to intuition because we've been trained to focus on intellect our entire education system works on intellect it doesn't really work on intuition but when you do yoga you become a training for intellect and then to intuition and the last one is anandamaya bliss so physical energetic thought intuitive bliss the subject of pranayam deals with the prana maya kosha the energetic body yeah now you cannot work on the energetic body if the physical body is a mess but once you have worked on the physical body then you have access to the energetic body which means that please don't think that you can go for a weekend breathing course it's not going to it's a waste of your time waste of your money it's not going to work you cannot go for a weekend meditation course it's not going to happen but when the body the physical body energetic body mental body vigyana intuitive body are more and more in sync automatically you have access to the bliss body yeah you don't have to do anything to be blissful you have to remove the distractions that are stopping you from being blissful this is what i would like to share with you and this is the great gift of pranayama you'll be happy for no reason ultimately you want to be happy for no reason how many reasons can make you happy a million a billion but what happens after that rather than that you are training from day 1 to be happy for no reason and this is what is going to happen when you do more and more and more pranayama yeah 
naturally blissful. Now, the pranayam that we did yesterday, I'll just quickly, we'll do it together. The right hand, we call this Vishnu Mudra. These two fingers together have the same weight as the thumb. I can teach it to you like this. But after five, six years, there'll be an imbalance because the weight of these two is more than the weight of the thumb. Subtle imbalance. If you're going to do pranayam 10 minutes a day, this is fine. I expect you, after a few years, to do it for maybe a longer time. And that, that's when it's better to use this. So you have two options. Either the hand is here and you're doing this manipulation. This is generally taught. But I find it, this is not natural. The classical way, we do it like this. Like this. Or, this might cause pain, we just do this. Yeah? Now, just as you're listening to me, keep doing this so that the hand gets used to it. This manipulation of the hand. There are four aspects to breathing. Purak. Inhalation, kumbak, antar kumbak, internal retention of breath. Turn air in, there's a nanosecond where there's a pause. At that pause, everything in the body comes to a standstill. Exhalation, then there's a nanosecond where there's a pause. And again, you breathe in. Yeah. When you do pranayama, you take less oxygen. Pranayama is looking at the subtle quality of air, not at the oxygen per se. When I normally breathe, I take about 15 breaths a minute. When I do pranayama, I'm doing about 4 breaths a minute. I'm getting less oxygen. So why the hell am I getting more energized? Yeah. It is not the oxygen alone. When I breathe in and hold the breath, yeah, so taking a deep breath, Hold the breath. So as you hold the breath, you're giving enough time for oxygen, hemoglobin to convert. The oxygen goes into the hemoglobin bloodstream. The carbon dioxide comes out. You're giving time. And then you exhale. So the gaseous exchange is much more effective. So the breathing is more effective. It is the holding of breath where Inner respiration happens. External respiration, oxygen in, carbon dioxide out. Inner respiration, oxygen at the alveoli sacs goes into the bloodstream. Carbon dioxide in the bloodstream comes into the alveoli sac and out. You'll study it at greater depth. But when you hold the breath, that is where the breathing becomes effective. Yeah? So, Purak is inhalation, controlled inhalation. Kumbak is holding of the breath. Kumb means a pot. So you become a pot of air within. Antar kumbak, internal retention. The Guinness record is about 17 minutes by the magician David Blaine. Yeah? Yogis in yoga, they're training to hold the breath for three hours. Now, obviously, they're not going to come for a Guinness record test. But they hold the breath for hours. They're training up to three hours. Like we said, when you can hold your body for two and a half hours, physical training comes to an end. You can then continue to train, but the purpose has been sorted. Yeah. Like that, according to scripture, if you can hold your breath inside for three hours, the need to train pranayam comes to an end. Now, you don't need to worry about three hours. It's just a figure for you to know that you can go quite far with this. But you got to just say, okay, today I can hold my breath for one minute. By the end of the course, can I hold for one and a half minutes? Yeah? A small thing like that will transform. So, antar Kumbak. External retention is called Rechak. Rechak. And Bahya Kumbak. Like when you did and lock, you were doing external retention of breath. The body 
cannot handle external retention. It starts to panic. Why? Because this is what happens at death. The last breath leaves the body never to come back in. So the body is tuned to get into survival mode if air stays out of the body for long. So Bahar Kumbak is very difficult. You've got to train, train, train. And it's not required. I would suggest to all of you, please don't rush with pranayam. In the yogic scriptures it says, like it takes a while to train a tiger or a lion or an elephant. Like that, pranayam should be trained very slowly. If you rush it, the subtle neural circuits get spoiled. A lot of people go mad because they try to go too fast into pranayama and meditation. Yeah? Uh, you are a 60 watt bulb. Tomorrow if you give 1000 watts, it's going to explode. But if you train your capability of body and breath and mind daily, 65, 70, 75, 80, in a certain amount of time you'll reach 1000 watts, but it won't be an issue. So that step-by-step -step process is what yoga is all about. So pranayam, don't be in a rush. You will damage yourself. You will damage the way you think. It's very subtle. So these are the four aspects of pranayam. Purak, kumbak, antar, internal kumbak. It is there in your books, don't worry. Rechak, exhalation, vahya or bahar kumbak external retention and we said pranayama is a training to hold the breath what we found by holding the breath the mind is blank focus happens so if the mind is blank that's a doorway into focus that's a doorway into meditation the buddha used to teach one breathing technique called keval kumbak whenever you're stressed just stop breathing the Buddha is one of the greatest psychologists we've ever had. What he says is that, I have not found anything that is permanent in life. Okay? Now for us, we try and say that these things are permanent in my life. Yeah? Just for us to know, the human body is constantly dying and replenishing. From the moment I've spoken to now, Millions of your cells have died. Yet, we have this idea that I am continuously alive. Every seven years, all the se not on the seventh year, but as a process, it takes about seven years for all the cells of the body to die and get replenished. It is just an idea that Manish, at the age of three, at the age of 15, at the age of 22 and at the age of 39 is the same person. Yeah. It's my memory that allows me to think of me as the same person. But essentially, what I was yesterday is very different, cellular speaking, from who I am today. Is that okay? Yeah. So this process is going on. So what the Buddha said is that whenever you're stressed, you don't have to try and solve the problem. It's going to go. You just stop breathing. By the time you start breathing, another thought has started. Are you running away from the problem? No, you're not. You're just understanding the nature of mind. The nature of mind is to constantly have an inner dialogue. Yeah? So, coming back to yesterday's point, in yoga, we don't give so much importance to what the mind is saying. Not because we trivialize it, because we understand that's the nature of the mind. It will keep talking. In meditation, you're not trying to stop the inner chatter. You're finding a space in you that's a little deeper from where you can watch that. If I'm stuck in traffic, it's very irritating. But if I'm perched high up on a hill and I can watch the traffic in the city, it's not irritating. Yeah? Like that, if you've found a space 
where you can watch the mind, it's fine. Yeah? So please don't waste any time trying to become thoughtless. If you just are able to watch your mind, it won't have so much importance. Easier said than done. Right? My whole life, I have pivoted on what my mind has told me. I married the person my mind told me to marry. I live in a place my mind asks me to live in. I do the work, my career is based on what my mind tells me. Therefore, what if the mind is giving me wrong feedback? My whole life will be a disaster. <laughs> Scary. Because I've relied only on my mind. If it's given me the wrong feedback for the last 20 years, it's a problem. When I do pranayama, when I do asana, I purify the body, I purify the prana, therefore my mind is purer. I'm more accessing my mind. And when I go beyond the mind to intuition and to bliss, now the chance of me getting bad or wrong feedback is much lower. Are we there? Therefore, I have to work on making this body, breath, work for me. Yeah. Today, I have done something to my body, I've eaten wrongly and I'm struggling to digest. Yeah. My mind's going to be focused only on the digestion. So I'm losing 4-5 hours of body-mind capability because it's focused on me coming from a sick state to just being a natural state again. So why put your body-mind through the trauma? I sleep too less and I'm tired in the morning. Why would I do that? If I were to really be interested in getting better energetically, I will sort that out. And this is true of everything. If I'm in a relationship that's making me, as we say, sort of five days out of seven, I'm trying to somehow sort it out. It's a lot of drain on resources. Yeah. So with the art of yoga, you will have to relook at every aspect of life to ensure that prana is where you want it to be. The body cannot be troubling you after 35 years of knowing how it works. Yeah. If even today, if you journal, please journal every day. If you find that your journal, five days out of seven, is saying, oh, no, but I ate this wrong, or I slept less, please sort it out. Yeah. After so many decades, by now, we should have learned what we should be eating, what time we should be eating, what we should be doing, like this. Yeah. Then pranayama becomes valuable. The point I'm making again and again is that if my body is in the wrong place, if my mind is in the wrong place, a little bit of breathing is not going to transform my life. But I have to start somewhere. Even if I breathe five minutes a day, a little slow, at least for the next few hours, I'm calm. That is a huge benefit for me if I have not been calm the whole day yesterday. But slowly this works. We're going to do pranayam during the asana class together. So I've spent the time explaining the subject. In the coming days, in the pranayam section of the class, you will be doing pranayam. I don't think it is possible to do Anulom Bilom unless you have trained or spent time working the asanas. Like yesterday, most of you said, I find breathing difficult, but today it was easier. Because there's a progression. Yama Niyam, Asan, Pranayam, Pratyahar, Dar, Dar and Dhyan. Asana, then Pranayam. If I just ask you to start breathing here, your hand will move but you may not have the focus. Yeah. So, 
the way we do it today will be just the way we did it yesterday. But now you have understood why you are doing this. Are we there? Balancing Ida Pingala so that meditativeness, Shushumna happens automatically. Why do I do the energizing pranayam? So first you have Kapal Bhati. Kapal Bhati is not classically called a pranayama. Kapal means the frontal lobe of the brain. Bhati means to shine. It's a Shatkriya. I just like to introduce what is Shatkriya, then I come back to Kapal Bhati. In Hatha Yoga, there are five kinds of practices. The first is, is it too much? Should I go on or you want to break? Can I finish with this? Shat Kriyas. Shat means six. Kriyas means techniques. There are six cleansing techniques. Number one, Kapal Bhati. We'll do it as we start the class. So I clean the nasal cavity. Number two, I clean the eyes by looking at a tip of a candle wick or looking at a fire. Yeah? So I clean the lacrimal glands. The eyes will water after a point. Yogis do it to the rising sun, setting sun, eventually even to the mid, the noon sun. Please don't do that. You'll spoil the cornea. But you can do it to the rising sun and the setting sun. So you're just looking at it. You'll do it as a practice one of the days. But you'll be looking at the fire, the tip of the wick of the candle. And then after 10 minutes, you'll close the eyes. You'll see an after image. That cleans the lacrimal glands. The third one is pouring water from one nostril, getting it out from the other. We call that as Jalaneti. We also put a rubber catheter here and take it out from the mouth to clean the buccal cavity. That is Neti. The fourth one is how do I clean the alimentary canal? So I drink water and then I regurgitate. I warm it. Or I put cloth inside and take it out. So I clean the bad bacteria in the alimentary canal. The fifth one is moving the stomach in and out. Or, and then moving it side to side. I'll show it to you today, moving the stomach. That is known as Nolly Kriya. So you clean the intestines. You alimentary, intestine, what is left is the colon, the, the large intestine and the colon. So you do Lagu Shanka Prakshalan, colon cleansing. Now this is mandatory practice. You cannot do Hatha Yoga if you don't do the cleansing. When I say Hatha Yoga, all forms, Vinyasa, Ashtang, you cannot do any of this if you have not cleansed the body. Yeah? So you will be doing it during your course. That is the first range of practice. The second range is Asana. Different Asanas to eventually train one sitting posture. Your training, it's weird, right? There are, according to classical yoga, 8.4 million asanas. One for every life form that was there on the planet. Even if you look at three, four hundred asanas that we know today, you're training for just one posture, one seated posture. Yeah. Because if you can tune into one posture, you're so comfortable for hours together, you tune your body-mind sensitivity to everything that is there. So one posture. Pranayama is the next range of practices. The fourth one is bandhas and mudras. Mudra, mu, happiness, dra, to draw. So when I put my fingers like this, I don't dissipate energy from my fingertips. Prana is not lost. It cannot be lost on the toes, they are locked. It can be lost at the fingers. Now I put my hands like this. It can be lost from the eyes, so I close my eyes. The main mudras are what I do with my tongue. So during this course, whenever you're listening to a lecture, take the tip of your tongue and put it to the upper palate. Kechri mudra. Yogis go a little extreme. They severe the uvula so that the tip of the tongue goes all the way here. You don't need to do that. Mm. <laughs> Not in three weeks. <laughs> But what you can do is just roll the tip of the tongue back and touch the upper palate. You'll find that immediately you're in a state of focus. Yeah. Essentially, if you lock yourself in a room for 50 years of your life, you'll understand how your body, emotions, mind work. 
they have done that, so we are using what they are telling us. Just the tip of the tongue there, you are immediately focusing better. And the last mudra is the eyes here. And the last range of practice, the fifth one, is listening to nada, sound. External, not really, internal sound. Yeah? You are listening to see, can I hear a sound within? Yeah? So basically meditation in classical yoga is focusing the mind on, can I hear some subtle sound within? I need to focus on something. Why should I use an external bead or gong or anything? Can I listen to my internal sound? Yeah? Yeah? Now, pranayama, therefore, kapal bhati is a shatkriya. It's a cleansing technique. In modern yoga, we also call it a pranayama. But the predominant energizing pranayama is bastrika, as we did yesterday. The difference in kapal bhati and bastrika, kapal bhati, forceful exhalation. <laughs> Inhalation is passive. Exhale forceful, inhale is happening. Bastrika, both are active. <laughs> yeah? Inhale and exhale, both are active. Most of the modern meditation techniques are based on this. If you look at the modern Indian gurus, the main techniques that they teach are changing the pace of breath. So you go so hum, slow breathing, then fast breathing, then slow breathing. When you do that, there will be a change in the prana quotient of the body. Yeah? So immediately, you will start to think or you will become silent. You might have seen this yesterday, when you did a hundred of these, after that, the three deep breaths were blissful. You became a bit silent. So that's energizing pranayama. The balancing pranayama we've already seen, anulom vilom. The next is the tranquilizing pranayama. You can do this. So we use this in summer, shitkari. As the air goes through the spit, it cools down the body. Yeah. Sometimes it can be useful in summer. But the main relaxing pranayams are two. One is Ujjayi. You will be using that during the class. Ujjayi means victory, victorious. You are replicating a snow. So just bear with me for these two pranayams. Then we take a break. And then we start our asana class. Good, we are almost on time. Ujjayi means victory. So what you do is you constrict the epiglottis, you constrict the throat. Yeah? As you constrict it, if I ask you to take a deep breath, you will do and you will do. If you can look at that, my breathing has become less because my nostrils have become closed. Yeah? So what you want to do is constrict the throat. So can you all make the, ex the exhalation all through the nose, not the mouth, but try to say the word sa. I'm just giving you a word because it's tough to try and visualize a sound without the mouth. So try and say the word sa when you breathe in, ha when you breathe out with the mouth closed. So let's do the exhalation first. Try and say the word ha. Can you hear a sound here? Can everybody hear that? Yeah? Can you do that yourself? So exhalation fairly simple. You can all do it already. Can you try inhalation? So don't do, but you are trying to say the word sa. You will hear a sound from here. Can you all try that? If you can't hear it, you can come in closer to me and you can hear that. If you can hear it already, that's fine. Can you hear? Yeah, so there's a subtle sound. I'll, I'll, I'll walk around so that we can all hear that. Exhalation we've got. Yeah. Inhalation is this sound. I'm making it louder so it sounds a bit weird. 
Can you hear that? Can you hear? Yeah? Can you guys hear? Yeah? And can you guys hear? This is a soft sound coming from here because the epiglottis is constricted. So you're replicating a snow. Therefore, this is what you do in every asana. In every asana, you do ujjayi pranayama. Because you're replicating a snow, it's very relaxing. You can hold the posture for long because the breathing is relaxing you. I would like you to think of asana training as pranayama in different postures. Yeah. So now I'm doing pranayama here. Now I'm doing pranayama here. So I've pivoted my entire practice, not so much on the muscles in every posture, yes, on what the muscles are doing, but I'm pivoting it more on the breathing. Yeah? Now, sometimes that also may not be enough. You still, the mind is running around. Yeah? Therefore, when you breathe in, you internally chant so. When you breathe out, hum. So hum means I am that. So hum. I am infinite. It is the sound that corresponds, the meaning is not important. It, it's the sound that corresponds closest to the sound of breath. Any system that works with breath, whether it's yoga or Buddhism, works with the sound so hum. Yeah? Clear with Ujjayi Pranayam. So we'll use it in the class today. And this is a pranayam you can do throughout the day. When you're working, walking and so on. The last pranayam I want to work with you guys is Brahmari. Brahmari means bumblebee. So a few of you are snoring now. I mean, sorry, sorry yawning now. Yeah? After Brahmari, maybe all of you should start yawning. It's meant for that. It's meant to relax so deeply. You do it before you go to sleep. Yeah. In the night, we usually do it. Brahmari is this. Through my mouth, I'm making a bumblebee sound. Not through the nose. I'm not doing... I breathe in through the nose, but I breathe out to do... Can you try this with me? The lips are pursed together. As the air gushes out, it creates this sonorous sound. Why is this sound made? As a response to this vibration, the body causes the secretion of serotonin. See, already a lot more of you are snoring, rather yawning. Right? It causes serotonin, so you relax very deeply. Yeah? Where does serotonin get secreted in the body? Serotonin, dopamine, when you're happy, when you're in love, when you're relaxed. Yeah? In Brahmari, you'll cause serotonin to get secreted. Generally, when you're stressed, vasoconstriction happens. The capillaries get constricted. When you do Brahmari, vasodilation, you become relaxed. Can we just recount the pranayams we've studied together? Anulom Vilom or Nadi Shodhana, Kapal Bhati and Bastrika, energizing. Shitkari has a very limited usage. Ujjayi and Brahmari, tranquilizing. And the last one that we call is Sahaj, simple pranayam. Breathe in, hold, breathe out, hold. Exhalation, double of inhalation. Why? The rate of thinking is dependent on the rate of exhalation. If I want to slow down my thinking, I just need to slow down my exhalation. Today we see in the neuroscience lab, when the exhalation is double the inhalation, the vagus nerve causes the parasympathetic nervous system to function. You don't have to try to relax. 
you just have to make exhalation double. Immediately, the heart rate will slow down, the breathing, of course, is slowing down, but the rest and digest mode starts. Now, you just have to make that double. So, that is Sahaj Pranayam. Let's take a break, guys. You've had a lot of information input. Uh, I'll see you in five minutes. Bef before I, when, we, when you come back, please keep your cushions, your, ta your books, everything up, and yoga mats the way it was yesterday. Maybe those of you who were at the back yesterday can come in the front, and the others can go back, so you get a chance to move around. Thanks, thanks.